Jimmy Austin. I interviewed Jimmy Austin in 1964 when he was 84 years old in Laguna Beach, California. That's near San Juan Capistrano, where the swallows come back every spring. He was born in Wales in 1879. <laughs> when I say those years, I'm astonished. Jimmy was in the majors for 14 years, from 1909 to 1922. He was with the Yankees and then spent most of his career in the big leagues with the St. Louis Browns. His rear end is the most famous rear end in the history of baseball. The reason for that is Charles M. Conlon took a famous photo of Ty Cobb sliding into third base in 1910. It was against the Yankees, and Jimmy Austin was the Yankees' third baseman. And you see Jimmy Austin trying to grab the ball and put him out. He didn't succeed. And the only thing you see of Jimmy is his rear end. The most famous action photo in baseball history. And Jimmy Austin's rear end is a big part of it. Jimmy was a good friend of Babe Ruth's. And one of his fondest memories is every time Babe Ruth hit a home run against St. Louis. As he rounded third, he would give a wink or a salute. He gave a big grin and a wave to Jimmy Austin, and Jimmy never forgot that. It was one of his fondest memories of the years he played. Then he took me into the next room, and there he found a glove Babe Ruth had given him, which here, 40 years since it was given to him, he still treasured and had it in a place of honor in his home. And unfortunately, Jimmy died a year later in 1965 at the age of 85, and he never did get to see the book published. You're a Welshman? Yeah. I was born in Swansea, Wales. My father was a shipbuilder in England. You see, in those days, they made wooden ships. And then they went to steel ships. My father came over here two years before us. You were in the miners for five years? Yeah. I was a sandlotter. Picked me up on the sandlot. And I was the kid. You know, you, you had to have somebody with a life on there to make you think you're looking like a ball club anyway. Yeah. And I had that energy. I had that. That's what kept me up there. It wasn't my hitting that's a cinch, because I was only a mediocre hitter. But I had a lot of go and good arm, good legs, you know, and lots of pep. Keep them alive. Pepper Austin, right? Yeah, that's the Stallings name. As soon as I hit the lead, the Pepper Kid, he named me. Oh, Stallings gave you that name. Yeah, he gave me that name. I never had it until I got to New York. When you were a rookie with the Highlanders, how did they treat you then? Oh, wonderful. I'll tell you how I got in there first. Mm -hmm. I was on the coaching at first base for the first month. You were coaching even though you were a rookie? Yeah, they had me coaching at first base. And Kid Everfield playing third. And he hit my ball down the right field line that I know was a good foot fair. And I said, go on, kid. Go on for two. Go for two. Of course, he could see the ball himself coming down the line. He rounded and he slid into second base and was safe. Tim Hurst was behind the plate, called it a foul. Kid got up brushing himself off, and he went right through the pitcher's box from second base and started jabbing Tim in the belly. And the Tim took his mask and whack right on his nose and his cheek and skinned it all up. That put me in the game. He got suspended for five days and fined 50 bucks. Stalling says, kid, you're playing third tomorrow. And when you're there, they never got me out for the two years. I was there 99, 19, 10. Now, Kid Everfield was, I guess he was the oldest on our club, see. And when he got in that rumpus and got kicked out and fined, I went in. Oh, I guess I played a couple of weeks. And we used upper and lower berths in those days in the train. So I was getting up in my berth. I had the upper berth. So he saw me going up there. So I saw him up in there and he gathered me by the ankle and he jerked me down. He said, what are you doing up there, kid? I said, this is my berth. Well, you were playing every day. That ain't your bird to hell it ain't. I said, I've had it ever since I've been in the club. I got this. And you're not going to have it anymore. He went to Tom Davis, our secretary. He said, put the kid down in the lower bird. He's touching like hell out there. The kid is obvious. 
Even though you were going to take his job away? Yeah. They were always nice. As long as I was up there, I never found any crabs like that. And now you know where we played then those days? We were the Highlanders. The Highlanders. Way up on the end of Broadway, you could look from the stand down the Hudson River. We had Willie Keeler the first year in right field. You played with Willie Keeler? Well, that one year. Yeah, was he still pretty good? He could loop him over the infield better than anybody in the world. He was still? But anywhere. He could pull him, push him, anything. He was no kid anymore. Right? Oh, no, he was about two. How big was he? <laughs> he was a little fella. He wasn't big as me, and I'm not too big, you know. What kind of a person was Willie? Oh, Keeler? wonderful. Well, he talked to me, he said, Jim, he says, if I can help you in any way I'd like to, and he says, with your speed and everything, you ought to make a great ball player. You've got a great career ahead of you. And he was a nice person. Oh, wonderful. I tell you, we had Russ Ford. Russ Ford Jack was the spitball. It wasn't exactly a spitter. He had something. What was it? What did he do? He had a piece of sandpaper on his belt oh. right there, and he'd rub the ball on it. <laughs> <laughs> and he was a good pitcher. <laughs> that ball would do a little couple of tricks, you know. When I first joined the Highlanders, there was no clubhouses. We didn't have a clubhouse at the ballpark anywhere. Never will forget one time we were in the Planters Hotel in St. Louis and we had our meeting and these was five miles out to the ballpark and they had four horses on a tally hole. And anyway, we discussed who was going to play. Well, somebody said, why, it's Lou Bardell today. Anyway, there's a saloon there on the opposite corner of the ballpark and here comes Rube out of this door, a big double door with a super beer that high. Coming out of the saloon. He had this big super of beer holding up, waving it. And somebody said, who said the room was going to pitch today? Look at him there. And sure enough, we start the game and here's old room pitching. And I'll never will forget as long as I live. Mac there was the manager. And I hit one and hit the top of the right field wall. Old Rube, he was watching me run around the bases like a seaman and fell on his can. Right on the rubber. <laughs> McAleer, Jimmy McAleer yelled, Come on in and out of there, you didn't want to pitch anyhow. <laughs> it took him out. He fell down watching you go around the bases. Oh, he fell right on his can. Mm -hmm. He was a great pitcher. Mm -hmm. Well, there was too, you know, yeah. Oh, yeah. You batted against Joe Wood in that year, 1912, when he was so good. Was he as fast as Johnson oh. that year? Well, he was pretty fast. I don't know, Walter had those long old arms and he could breeze them in there. Longest arms I ever saw in the guy. And boy, they were whips. He could whip that ball in there. But I'd rather bat against Walter than I would Joe Wood. Why? Well, because Walter was so damn careful. He was afraid he'd hit somebody. Really? Walter was too good a guy, you know. He was a swell guy. One day, he had, he had us beat about 10 to 2 or something. He says to me, he says, here's one right in there. Let's see you hit it. <laughs> Give me a fast one right in there. And I hit it over the right field fence. <laughs> laugh? He laughed all the time. I was going to laugh. He was one of those guys. Good guy, you know. But on a cloudy day, you couldn't even see the ball coming in there. Oh, geez, that day in St. Louis, I tell you, it was murder. One day, we were down, playing down in St. Louis, and Wallace pitching. Then I got a ball, Tommy says, strike. And I looked around kind of quick like that, you know. He says, Jim, that was right in there. I says, I didn't have a thought. I can't prove it by me. You didn't see the ball come over at all? Dad, by me, that's all. Yeah. Who was the best pitcher you ever batted against? Really the best. I think Walter was. He was. He was smart as well as fast. Oh, yes, he was. Well, they were, for years, you know, they said, well, Walter don't have no curve. You know, he didn't need it. Towards the end, though, he, he developed a curve. He had a lot of stuff. 
How would you compare Koufax's speed with Walter Johnson? Oh, geez, that, that guy, yeah, he must have, he's got a lot of stuff. He really has. You take Grove, you know, he had a lot too. Yeah, but this yeah. Koufax, he, he must be a whiz. I think he's, uh, he's up there with Walter and that guy. You gotta test what he done, you know. He's the best of the day, I think. You saw, I guess, play the two greatest first basemen that ever lived. Sister and Chase. Yeah. Yes, sir. Which was the best? And I threw to both of them, many of all. Which was the best? Sis could hit along the ball, maybe, than Chase. But between you and I, I have to say Chase. And boy, he could cover that ground, he could do anything. He was the best fielder of the two. In my estimation. Well, he couldn't hit with Sisler. Well, he always hit. He could hit and run, he could do anything. He didn't hit 400, though, either, did he? Oh, it's just at 420 and 22. So you can't take anything away from either of them. They're both great. But you'd hear more about Chase if he'd been on the level. You know what he's done, don't you? You know why they fired him out of the league? Got to gambling. Christy Madison went down to Cincinnati to manage the club, and he got him down there. And uh, Christy Matheson exposed him. And that was the last of Chase. Yes. He just ruined a great career. He, he's forgotten, you see. Did he have any friends on the ball court? People who were close to him? None on our club. And it's his own fault, too. One day, somebody gave Jack Knight a good bat. You know, it just suited him, and he went along with it, and boy, he hit like a fool with it. Hal says, you don't mind if I use your bat, do you, Jack? And he says, I'd rather you not, because it's the only one I got. Oh, he got mad, and he took it and slammed it up against the wall over there. And Hal was always doing that. If I had a good one, or if somebody else had was going good with a bat, why, well, he, let me use your bat. See, he could get a thousand bats himself. But he wanted the other guy who was hitting good. So he made enemies that way. I want to ask you about this famous picture, Ty Cobb sliding into third and knocking you up in the air. Yeah. And that's me. This is Ty Cobb. Look at his determination. That's a famous picture. Yes, yeah. Oh, they use that an awful lot. Do you remember when that happened? Yes. Cobb took my this foot with his shoulder, see? But he was safe anyway. Okay, now you were a third baseman and Cobb was on the bases a lot. Was he a fair or an unfair base runner? He nicked me a couple of times, but it's my fault. I'm not blaming him. One day he's on first base and there's a ball hit the right field. So he comes all around and I stand there, you know, nonchalant, as though nothing's happening, see. In the last minute, here comes the ball. And Ty slid in and I took it. And I swept his foot off the bag, and Connie says, you're out. Ty lay in there on the ground, looked up at me, and he said, mister, he said, mister, don't never do that no more. And his southern brogue. <laughs> but <laughs> he and I were pretty good friends. He's better off the field he is on. When he's out there in that ball game, look out. He's out to win. I saw him cut Jack Berry from there clear down. You see, Philadelphia and Detroit were fighting for a penalty, and they got nasty, an old tie. He can get nasty. But off the field, he's a pretty good guy. You don't talk about Ty Cobb with as much fondness as you talk about Babe Ruth, though, do you? Oh, no. Babe had a heart. He really had a heart. Heart of gold. Good fellow. He was a friendly fellow. Oh, wonderful. Wonderful. I've seen him stand for an hour, an hour and a half, signing the cards and nothing else. So I asked the babe, I said, baby, you got an old worn out glove that you can spare. He said, by God, I have you. He came out with that. I said, well, this is a new one. I don't want this. I don't know what that you don't want. Take that. This is Babe Ruth's glove? Yeah. <laughs> I'll be. I've, uh, you know, this, you is, know, a, this uh, is a pretty uh, valuable thing, one of Babe Ruth's gloves. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, he just been ready to break this thing in. It's practically brand new, you can see. Yeah. 
course, you know, as we uh, keep pounding, we got a pocket in this. That looks like a little tiny thing compared yeah. to a glove today. Yeah. No? There's really no pocket in it. No, not yet. There would be later. You know, you look back, you saw Cobb, you saw Sisler, you saw Ruth. Yeah, Garrick. Garrick. You saw Joe Jackson play a lot, too, didn't you? Oh, sure, yes. I saw Joe play. Was he as great a hitter oh, as he was? Oh, gee. Yeah. Did I say he was a great Yeah, hitter? he was great. Even in that series in 1919, he hit 380. Yeah. Of course, he wasn't too smart, evidently. Oh, no. No, he wasn't. That's it. See, that's the trouble. Bobby Wallace was a good shortstop then, still? Oh, yeah, but he was failing, see. He yeah. was his legs. You see, the first thing that goes is your legs. Now, for instance, take high, Cobb, Spoke, old Spoke, take Larry Lazar away. They could still hit, but hell. Oh, Larry, you know, by the way, when he was managing Cleveland, he tried to get me two or three times. He always liked me. And he could comb him down that third baseline like nobody's business. And he really could hit. A lot of times you get those fast ones on a bad hop in between. So I just smile and let him hit me, then scramble around and throw him out. He said, you son of a bitch, next time I'm going to carry you out the left field. I'm going to hit it so hard. What's the hardest? I'll bet you that I was the, the only third baseman in the world ever to make a put out at first base. How did you do that? Well, it was in Washington. Guy hit one up in the air, and I could see the sisters having trouble seeing the sun was in his eyes, see, and he lost it. Well, sir, I ran over there, and I just missed catching it, but I got it on the bounce, and I beat the guy he was <laughs> running back to first base, and I run back and tagged him at first base <laughs> for a put out. That's a fact. You've tagged the batter. Yes. He got jammed up, and I caught him before he got back to first base. <laughs> And tagged him out. You played for two weeks with a broken finger. Yeah, with that. They wouldn't do that today now, would they? <laughs> I doubt it. I doubt it. I doubt it. No days they did that. Yeah. We done lots of things in those days they won't do today, but in a lot of ways it seems like the old ball player was a lot tougher person. I think we played more for the love of the game than they do today. They're after that almighty dollar today. Of course, it's different. Do you follow the ball games on TV much? Every one I can see. Never miss. Saturday and Sunday, you know, we get the game of the week, and uh, I get the others on the radio. My goodness sake, you were talking when I left, and are you still going? <laughs> yeah, three Apparently weeks. you'll be horse for a month. <laughs> Thank goodness. <laughs> Thank goodness. <laughs>